everyone. My name is Kat Baxter. I'm the Curator of Archaeology for Leeds Museums and Galleries and I'm currently the Secretary of the Society for Museum Archaeology. So you've already heard something about archaeological archives and what I'd like to talk to you about for the next 15-ish minutes is what happens to the archive when it comes into the museum. What do we actually do to take care of it and to ensure that it's accessible in order that it can be used in the many ways which Kate will outline later. The important thing to understand when an archive is deposited with a museum is that it isn't simply about physically storing it. It's not just about finding some shelf space to shove it on for the next hundred years. Obviously having that shelf space does matter because without it museums can't accept archives. And we all know that museums are in and out of space. But it's not just about storage space. It's also about having the staff, resources and knowledge to look after the archive so we can use it ourselves and to provide access to other people to use. This all comes under the umbrella of our collections management and collections care policies. You can't use an archive until you've got the collections care right. So here's a list of the processes we have to consider when we're managing the collection. Each museum will approach collections care slightly differently. We all have different procedures and use different materials and collections databases, but we're all using them to the same standards, using the same principles. The standards we work to are called spectrum standards, and these make clear the minimum standards in museums for collections management. And if you're interested, you can look at these standards on the Collections Trust website. SMA also recently published the new standards and guidance in the care of archaeological collections, which is what we're all working towards. So what I'm talking about now is mainly what we do in Leeds Museums and Galleries, because that's my main experience, but it isn't the definitive way of doing things. So Leeds as a service, we've been collecting for nearly 200 years and we have large and varied collections, including archaeology, obviously. And the archaeology collection ranges from the ruins of Kirkstall Abbey, which is a medieval monastery, to British, Roman, Greek, Near Eastern, Egyptian and North American artefacts. Plus, we've got a large numismatics collection with thousands of ancient coins. And all these have been collected in different ways. And obviously here you've got lovely objects on display, professionally photographed. But the most um, frequent way we collect by far nowadays is through archives generated in advance of commercial development, in our case within Leeds Metropolitan District. And it's important that it's written into our collecting policy that we are the repository for these archives. A collecting policy is what forms the framework around what a museum does and does not collect. And although there's no legal obligation for us to accept archives, we obviously value how important they are to our heritage and we will collect them for as long as we have the space to do so. So what happens to an excavation archive after it has been deposited and checked by us and the transfer paperwork has all been signed? And here's a list of things that we check when archives are deposited with the museum. The archive will already have an accession number which we'll already have issued and this should have been marked on all objects and paperwork so we know everything's from this particular site. An accession number is a unique museum number which all objects are assigned when they officially enter the museum collection. And of course the objects will already be beautifully packed within the archive. So when the archive arrives I will write an entry into our accession register detailing the site and giving a, giving a description of the archive. The accession registers are our primary documentation for objects coming in and the originals are kept in a secure location. Once written in the register, the archive itself is put through the freezer. At Leeds, we have a freezer large enough for a yak, our biggest taxidermied animal. Apologies that I couldn't find a photo of our yak-sized freezer. 
Collections which won't be damaged by freezing will go through the freezer which drops to minus 10 degrees for five days. And this is to kill any pests which might be living or laying eggs on either the objects or the packing materials that they're packed in. It stops pests getting into the store and really causing damage to some of the more vulnerable collections like textiles and taxidermy. After the archive or parts of it have been frozen, it's piled up in our store to be processed. Obviously, it's not still frozen at this point. It has gone back to normal. I'll mark each box with a box number and each box is given a record on our collections database or collections management system. The one we use at Leeds is called TMS, which stands for the museum system, but different museums use different databases, but they all pretty much do the same thing. And this is a typical collections management system. This isn't TMS. I think it might be modes. I think it's Bristol system. On each record on the system, I'll input a brief description of the contents of each box, what materials are in the box, site data and site codes for cross-referencing. So everything is searchable at a basic level. So if someone approached me later with a finds number or a site code, or even a query about, is there any worked bone from this site, for instance, I should be able to find everything fairly easily. Once this basic cataloguing has been done, that's the time when I find those empty shelves to physically store it. The archive will already have been stored, uh, archived in box sizes to specifically fit on shelves in our roller racking. So boxed material like ceramics will sit in the main archaeology store on our roller racks. Metalwork, which you can see there on the left, will be stored in a separate area in their steward boxes. We keep all the metalwork separate because it's easier for our conservator to access it all together when she's changing over silica gel. The large stonework will be laid out on lower shelves designed for large objects. And that's some of our archaeological stonework that you can see on the right. And coins might be removed and put into the safe with the rest of the coin collections. If there are human remains in the archive, they will be stored in a separate area with the rest of the human remains collection in line with best practice. At the moment, paper archives also go into the main store as well. And the digital archive will be curated in an approved digital repository. So all of these new locations are inputted into each box record on the database. So now we know what there is and where it is. And obviously the amount of time and effort which goes into this basic cataloging depends on the size of the archive. So if you get an archive of 250 boxes, obviously that can take a really long time to sort out. So our collection store itself is kept stable at 16 degrees and 40 to 50 percent relative humidity and most of the collection is stored in one big space. Other museums might store different types of materials in separate stores with their own specific conditions depending on their setup. So now we know what there is and where it is. It's in suitable conditions for long-term long storage and it is accessible for those who want to use it. So next we look more at the details of the archive. And so far I'll have done all of this by myself since I'm the only archaeology curator in the service. And that's not me complaining. Many museums don't even have a specialist archaeology curator. So collection staff have to deal with not only archaeology but lots of other collections as well. In the past, I've managed to get either volunteers looking for collections experience or interns to work on cataloguing their small finds individually. We read the publication about the site or the reports and we go through the small finds. Those archaeologists who've worked on the site will know that site really well, but as a curator, I have to learn it from scratch, even if I've already visited the excavation in progress. And it's a shame really that there isn't more time for us to cross over in the different stages of field work and then in the museum life of the archive. 
Small finds, some pottery and some stonework will be accessioned individually using sequential numbers added on to the archive accession number. The finds are marked with their new accession number individually and then they're photographed for the database. And you can see here a hand axe which has a museum number marked on it. And the idea is that the museum number is reversible so it doesn't cause any damage to the object itself. Data about each object is transferred onto our database, onto the individual object records. And here's an example on our database TMS of a trumpet brooch um, object record on our database. Bulk finds stay on the database in bulk, which makes sense. So we work through the archive and this can obviously take a lot of time if it's a large excavation archive which has been ongoing for many, many years. But I've talked about acquisition of archives and I really should say something about rationalisation. Because SMA carried out a historic England funded project to look at whether rationalising existing archives in museum stores would help create space in museums for future collecting. And five very different services from different parts of the country took part in the study. And what they had to do was to look at the practicalities of a scoping study to assess what they already had, and then look at the financial implications of carrying out full rationalisation. The headlines from this scoping study, um, the headlines, sorry, from this project were that the scoping study was worth doing in its own right. To, to increase collections knowledge. But rationalisation does not release lots of space in stores and it is really expensive. In fact, one museum service concluded that it would cost the same to just buy a new store rather than carry out rationalisation. If you're interested, the report on this is available on the SMA website. One more thing I'll say is that accessibility doesn't stop with physical access to the archive. It's also really important to have access to collections knowledge through our staff and resources. It's also important that we try to ensure that people know what we have. And we haven't always been great at this when it comes to archaeological archives, because it isn't the dazzling bling and display items that we like to show off on our social media platforms and website. But museums are getting better at sharing what they have over digital platforms and making their collections available online in a number of ways. Because while archives might be physically accessible in museums, the people who might want to access them need to know that they are there in the first place for them to be of any use. So thank you very much for listening to what was a very quick tour through Collections Care of Archaeological Archives. I will hand over to Kate, who will tell you much more exciting things than I have about what we actually do with archives and museums once they are stored properly and made accessible. Thank you.